afternoon, brilliant humans, and welcome back to theCUBE. We're live in Detroit, Michigan at KubeCon, and I'm joined by John Furrier. John, three exciting days, buzzing, how you doing? Yeah, it's great. I mean, we're coming down to the third day, we're keeping the energy going, but this segment's going to be awesome. The CD Foundation's doing amazing work. Developers are going to be running businesses and workflows are changing, productivity's the top of conversation, and you're going to start to see a coalescing of the communities for our continuous delivery, and it's going to be awesome. And, and our next guest is an outstanding person to talk about this. We are joined by Stephen Chin, the, the chair of the CD Foundation. Stephen, thanks so much for being here. No, no, my pleasure. I mean, this has been an amazing week, both at KubeCon, with all of the announcements, all of the people who came out here to Detroit, and, you know, fantastic. Like, just walking around, you bump into all the right people here. Um, plus, we held a CD Summit zero day event and had a lot of really exciting announcements this week. Gotta love the shirt, I gotta say, it's one of my favorites. Love the logos, love the, love the branding. That project's got traction. What's the news in the CD Foundation? I tried to sneak in the back. I got a little late into your uh, co-located event. It was packed, everyone's engaged. Um, it was really, look, look really cool. Give us the update, yeah, what's yeah, the yeah, news? Yeah, no. so um, we, we had a really, really powerful event. All the key practitioners, the open source leads and folks were there. And um, one, of the, one of the things which I think we've done a really good job in the past six months with the CD Foundation is getting back to the roots and focusing on technical innovation, right? This is what drives foundations, having strong projects, having people who are building innovation, and also um, bringing in a new innovation. So one of the projects which we added to the CD Foundation this week is called Persia. So it's a, it's a decentralized package repository for getting open source libraries, and um, it solves a lot of the problems which you get when you have centralized infrastructure, you don't have the right security certificates, you don't have the right verification of libraries, and these, these are all things which large companies provision and build out inside of their infrastructure, but the open source communities don't have the benefit of the same sort of um, really, really strong architecture. A lot of, a lot of the systems we depend That's upon. That's a good point, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you think about the systems that developers depend upon, we depend upon, you know, NPM, Ruby Gems, Maven Central. Mm -hmm. yeah. These systems have been around for a while. Yeah. Like they serve the community well, right? They're they're well supported by the companies, and it's 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 yeah. really a great contribution that they give us. But every time there's an outage or there's a security issue, guess guess how many security issues that our, our research team found in NPM? Just ballpark. Seventy four. <laughs> <laughs> so there are it's gotta be thousands. I mean, yeah. I mean it's gotta yeah. be a lot of tons yeah, of no. they're they're currently up to sixteen thousand. Whoa! Vulnerable malicious packages in NPM. And oh my gosh. So that's a, that's that's a, that's a jarring that's number a even. So I know it was going to be huge, but holy moly. Yeah. So that's a software supply chain in action right there. So that's, that's open source, everything's out there. What's, how, do, how, does, how do you guys fix that? Yeah, so per Persia kind of shifts the whole model. So when, when you think about a system that can be sustained, it has to be something which, which is not just one company. It has to be a, a, a set of companies be vendor neutral and be decentralized, so yeah. that's why we um, donated it to the Continuous Delivery Foundation. So that can be that governance body which, which makes sure it's not a single company. It has to use modern technologies, so you, you, you just need something which is immutable, yeah. so it can't be changed, so you can rely on it. It has to have a strong transaction ledger, so you can see all of the history of it, you can build up your software build materials off of it, and it, it has to have a strong peer-to-peer -peer architecture so it can be sustained yeah. long term. Steven, you mentioned something I want to just get back to. You mentioned um, outages and disruption. I, you didn't say just outages, but this whole disruption angle is interesting. If something happens, talk about the impact to the developer. Are they stalled, inefficiencies create, basically disruption. No, I mean, if, if so, so if you think about most DevOps teams and big companies, they support hundreds or thousands of teams and an hour of outage, all those developers, they, they can't program, they can't work, and that's, that's a huge loss of productivity for the company. Now if you, if you take that up a level, when NPM goes down for an hour, how many millions of man hours are wasted 
by not being able to get your builds working, by not being able to get your code to compile, like it's, it's. I, yeah, I mean, it's almost hard to fathom. I mean, everyone's, it's stopped. Exactly. It's literally like having the plug pulled exactly. on whatever and you're working that's, on. That's the fundamental problem we're trying to solve, is it, it needs to be on a, like a well-supported, yeah. <laughs> well-architected, peer-to-peer um, network yeah. with some strong backing from big companies. So um, the companies working on Persia yeah. include JFrog, which who I work for, Docker, yeah. Oracle, uh, we have Deploy Hub, Huawei, a whole bunch of other folks who are also helping out. And w when you look at all of those folks, th they all have different interests, but it's designed in a way where no single party has control over the network. So really, it's, it's a system you, you're not relying upon one company or one logo, yeah. you're relying upon a well-architected open source implementation that everyone can rely on. It's shared software, but it's kind of a fault tolerant feature too. It's like, okay, if something happens here, you have a distributed piece exactly. of it decentralized, you're not going to go down, you can remediate. All right, so where does this go next? I mean, because we've been talking about the role of the developer. This needs to be a modern, I won't say modern upgrade, but like a modern workflow or value chain. What's your vision? How do you see that? Because you're in the center of the CD foundation coming together. You, people are going to be coalescing, multiple groups. Yeah. What's no, no, the vision? I think, that, I think this is a good point. So there, there's a, a lot of different um, continuous delivery, continuous integration technologies. Um, we're actually, from a Linux Foundation standpoint, we're coalescing all the continued delivery events into one big conference You next just year. made an announcement about this earlier this week. Tell us about CD events. What's going on? What's in, what's in the cooker? Yeah, and I think one of the big announcements we had was the 0.1 release mm -hmm. of CD events. And CD events allows you to take all these systems and connect them in an event, scalable, event-oriented architecture. The first integration is between um, Tekton and Kepton. So cool. now you can get CD events flowing cleanly between your, um, your continuous delivery and your observability. And this extends through your entire DevOps pipeline. We, we all need a standards-based framework yep. for how we get all the disparate continuous integration, continuous delivery, observability, yep. systems to, to work together that's also high performance, it scales with our needs, and it, it kind of gives you a future architecture to build on top of. So a lot of the companies I was talking with at um, the CD Summit, yeah. they were very excited about not only using this with the projects we announced, but using this internally as an architecture to build their own DevOps pipelines on. I bet that feels good to hear. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you mentioned Tekton. They just graduated, I saw. How many projects have graduated? So we have two graduated projects right now. We have Jenkins, which mm -hmm. is the first graduated project. Now Tekton is also graduated. And I think this shows that um, for Tekton it was, it was time. A very mature project, great support, getting a lot of users, and having them join the set of graduated projects in the Continuous Delivery Foundation is a really strong portfolio. And we have a bunch of other projects which also are on their way towards graduation. Feels like a moment of social proof, I bet, for yeah, you all. Yeah, yeah, no, it's really good. Yeah. <laughs> How long has the CD Foundation been around? Um, the CD Foundation has been around for, I, I, I want to say the exact number of years, a few years now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but I, I think that it, it was formed because what we wanted is we wanted a foundation which was purpose built. Mm -hmm. So um, CNCF is a great foundation. It has a very large umbrella of projects. And it takes kind of that big umbrella approach where a lot of different efforts are joining it, a lot of things are happening, and you can get good traction, but it produces its own bottlenecks mm -hmm. yeah. in process. Having a foundation which is just about continuous delivery caters to more of a DevOps professional, DevOps audience. I think this, mm -hmm. this gives a good platform for best practices. We're working on a new CDF best practices yeah. guide. Um, we're working with use cases with all the member companies, and it gives that thought leadership platform for continuous delivery, which you need to be an expert yeah. in that area. And the best practices too, and, and, and to identify the issues 
because at the end of the day, with the big thing that's coming out of this is velocity mm -hmm. and more developers coming on board. I mean, this is the big more trend. More people doing more, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, if you take this open source, continues to thunder away, you have more developers coming in, they be more productive, and then people are going to even either on the DevOps side or on the straight app to web side. And this is going to be a huge issue. And the other thing that comes out that I want to get your thoughts on is the supply chain issue you talked about is hot. Verifications and certifications of code is something big issue. Can you share your thoughts on that? Because yeah. this is becoming, I won't say a business model for some companies, but it's also becoming critical for security that code's verified. Yeah, okay, so I, I think one, one of the things which um, we're specifically doing with the Persia project, which is unique, is rather than distributing, for example, libraries that you developed on your laptop and yeah. compiled there, or maybe they were built on you know, a runner somewhere like Travis CI or GitHub Actions. All the libraries being distributed on Persia are built by the authorized nodes in the network, and then they're, they're verified across all of the authorized nodes. So you, nice. you have a, a the basic guarantee we're giving you is when you download something from the Persia network, you'll get exactly the same binary as if you built it yourself from source. So there's a lot of trust. And, and, and you, transparency. Yeah. yeah. Exactly, and if you remember back to like yeah. kind of the seminal project which kicked off this whole supply chain security like, like Whirlwind, it was SolarWinds. Yeah. yeah. And the exact problem they hit was the build ran, it produced a result, they modified the code of the build, of the resulting binary, and then they signed it. So if you built with the same source, and then you went through that same process a second time, you would have gotten a different result, which was a malicious right. tree. Yeah. And it's very hard to take, to take yeah. a binary file yeah. and determine if there's malicious code in it, because it's not like source code. You can't inspect it, you can't do a code audit. It's totally different. So I think we're solving a key part of this with Persia, where you're freeing open source projects yep. from the possibility of having their binaries, their packages, their end reduces tampered yep. with. And also upstream from this, you do want to have verification of PRs, people doing code reviews, making yep. sure that they're looking at the source code. And um, I think there's a lot of good efforts going on in the Open Source Security yep. Foundation. So mm -hmm. I'm also on the governing board of OpenSSF. Yep. Do you sleep? You have three jobs, you've said on camera. No. I can't even imagine. <laughs> yeah. Didn't you just spin that out from this um, open source security? Is that the new one? They yeah, so out? the Open Source Security Foundation is um, one of the new Linux Foundation projects. They, they have been around for a couple years, but they did a big reboot okay. last okay. year, around this time. And I think what they really did a good job of now is bringing all the industry players to the table, um, having dialogue with government agencies, figuring out like what do we need to do to support open source projects? Is it yeah. more investment in memory safe languages? Yeah. Do we need to have more investment in, in code audits or like um, security reviews of open source of projects? And yeah. all of those things require money, investment, yeah. and that's what all of the companies, including JFrog, are doing to advance open source supply chain security. I mean, it's, it's really kind of interesting to watch the different demographics of the developers and the vendors and the customers. On one hand, if you're a hardware person, company, you, have, you talk zero trust. Mm -hmm. Your software, mm -hmm. you talk trust. So your trusted code and you got zero trust. It's interesting, depending on where you're coming from, they're all trying to achieve the same thing. I mean, zero trust makes sense, but then also, I got code, I, don't, I want trust. Trust and verify. So, Security is in everything now, so code. So how do you see that traversing over? Is it just semantics or uh, what's so, your view on that? The, the right way of looking at security is from the standpoint of the hacker. Because they're always looking for- Well said, very well said. New, loophole, new yeah. loopholes, new yeah. exploits, and they're, they're very, very smart people. And I think when you, when Some you look at- Some of the smartest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I work with, well, former hackers, now security <laughs> researchers. <laughs> <laughs> the converted, <laughs> the but, recruited. But when you look at them, there's like two main classes of like, like types of exploits. So some, some attacker groups, what they're looking for is they're looking for holes. Zero days, CVEs, like yeah. existing vulnerabilities that they can exploit to break into systems. Mm -hmm. But there's an increasing number of attackers who are now on the opposite end of the spectrum. And what they're doing is they're creating their own exploits. So oh. they're, for example,
putting malicious code into open source projects. Little by Trojan getting, horse status. Yeah, they're, they're yeah. getting their little Trojan horses in. Yeah. Or they're finding supply chain attacks by maybe uploading a malicious library to NPM or to mm -hmm. PyPy. And by creating these attacks, especially ones that start at the top of the supply chain, mm -hmm. you have such a large reach. I was just going to say, it could be a whole, yeah. it almost gives me chills as we're talking about it, the systemic so this is, this integration is the sort of stuff like, like yeah. nation state attackers, like people who want to yeah. do serious damage. It's engineered doing. hack, just that they're high, highly funded, high, mm -hmm. highly skilled, exactly. highly agile, highly focused yes. teams, team, not in teams. Yeah, and so so one one example of this, which um, actually netted quite a lot of money for the um, for the hacker who exposed it, was um, you guys probably heard about this, but it was a um, an attack where um, they uploaded a malicious library to npm mm -hmm. with the same exact um, namespace as a corporate library. And Clever so and happens, creepy. It's called a dependency injection attack. And what happens is if you, if you don't have the right sort of security package management guidelines inside your company, and it's just looking for the latest version and merging multiple repositories as like a, like a single view, a lot of companies were accidentally picking up the latest version, which was out in NPM, uploaded by Alex Pearson was the one who did the, um, the attack, and um, he simultaneously reported bug bounties on like a dozen different companies and netted 130K. Wow. So like these sort of attacks that they're real, yep. they're exploitable, and the, the hackers complex, who are finding these sort of attacks now in our supply chain are the ones who really are the most yeah. dangerous. That's the biggest threat to us. Yeah, and we have hacker ones out there. You got a bunch of other services. The white hat hackers get the bounties. Mm -hmm. That's really important. All right, what's next? What's your vision of this show as we end KubeCon? What's the most important story coming out of KubeCon in your opinion, and what are you guys doing next? Um, well, I, I actually think this is, this is probably not what most folks would say is the most exciting story at KubeCon, but I find this personally the best is... I can't wait for this now. Um, so on, on Sunday, the CNCF ran the first Kids Day. Oh. And so they had a... a Free kids workshop for you know underprivileged kids for I hadn't for heard local about people this. in the That's Detroit awesome. area. Um, it was it was taught by some of the folks from the CNCF community. So um, um, Arun, Eric, Han, um, my my older daughter Cassandra is also an instructor, so she also was teaching a Raspberry Pi workshop. Amazing, and she's and, here. Yeah, yeah, she's also here at the show. And when you think about it, you know, there's always there's there's you know hundreds of announcements this week, a lot of exciting technologies, some of which we've talked yeah. about, but it's it's really what matters is the community. It, this is a community first event. And, and the people, mm -hmm. and like if we're giving back to the community and helping yeah. Detroit's yeah. kids to get better at technology, to get educated, yeah. I think that it's a worthwhile for all of us to be here. I, yeah. What a beautiful way to close it. That is such, I'm so glad you brought that up and brought that to our attention. I wasn't aware of that. Did you yeah. know that was no, happening, John? I did not John? know about that. Yeah, no, that was. Yeah. That. And that's next generation too. And what we need, we need to get down into the elementary schools. We got to get to the kids. They're all doing robotics club anyway in high school. Computer science <laughs> is now, now a sport. Well, in my opinion, I think that if you're in a privileged thing. community though, I don't think that every school's doing robotics well, I mean, and that's Cal Poly, why. Cal Poly and the universities are stepping up and I think CNCF's leadership is amazing here mm -hmm. and we need more of it. I mean, I'm, I'm bullish on this. I love it. I think it's a really great story. No, I, I am absolutely, and, and it just goes to show how committed CNCF is to community, putting community first, and Detroit. There's been such a celebration of Detroit this whole week. Stephen, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Best wishes with the CD Foundation. John, thanks for the banter as always. And thank you for tuning in to us here, live on theCUBE in Detroit, Michigan. I'm Savannah Peterson, and we are having the best day. I hope you are too.